It's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, the president of the uh, AAP, who will now deliver the uh, presidential address, an annual event at this meeting. Uh, Paul Rothman is dean of the medical faculty at Johns Hopkins and CEO of the Hopkins Healthcare System. Uh, he is a molecular immunologist whose research career focused on cytokine biology, particularly in hematopoietic cell di differentiation, a uh, previous Pew scholar, um, a Leukemia Society scholar, uh, and formerly dean of the University of Iowa, um, president of the AAP 2014-2015. Paul, we look forward to your comments. Thanks, Dan. So good afternoon. I thanks everyone for coming this afternoon, and it's really been an honor to serve as president of the AAP. What you learn is uh, when you do, most of us are used to giving scientific talks. These days I give more fundraising talks than I do scientific talks. But this is a special speech, and as tradition has, um, you sit back and you read uh, old AAP president speeches, and there's some wonderful speeches um, I, I told uh, Larry Jamison last year I really enjoyed his and, and, and many others, but because I'm at Hopkins, I went back and read um, uh, the speeches of um, William Oslo from 1895 and William Welch in 1901, who were my predecessors in this role. And when you read all these old speeches, what you take away is many things, uh, not only the, the history of this um, society, but more importantly, really that we have the very privilege of being in this profession. And although we often talk about how we enjoy doing things that we love, what I really think is the honor is that we are surround ourselves with like-minded individuals who are not only in generally very brilliant, very smart, and very hardworking, but people who really dedicate their lives to the betterment of mankind, to the advancement of science, and to our patients. And we sometimes forget that as we worry about NIH grants and um, getting your manuscript accepted and reviewer number three and all the hard things that we do. It's really the fact that, we, that the people around us are similarly really striving to help mankind, to better our communities that I really think is a privilege of our profession. So I wanted to thank you all and we have some of the young um, MD PhDs in the room and just think about that as you think about your career path because for me that has really been the biggest pleasure of, of being a physician scientist. So I, talked, I thought about what I talked about today and I went back to really the statement of purpose of AAP and I'll read it because I'm sure um, not everyone in this room remembers it. So the AAP, the uh, stated purpose is the advancement of scientific and practical medicine. Scientific and practical medicine. So when I think about that and thought about what I might talk about, I went back to my roots. So I went back to when I decided to do science, which was in my AP biology class in Bayside High School in Bayside, Queens, New York. So that might be a little strange to you. In the time I was just a normal kid, it was uh, 1975. Uh, my heroes at the time were Walt Clyde Frazier, Tom Seaver, and Joe Namath. And I, had, I took this AP bio class, and I'll still remember the instructor, Dr. Mark Yohalem, and he provided the class at the beginning of the year, Scientific American Street, and that was one of the things we did regularly every month in that class. And he brought in a copy of Scientific America in which they announced the Nobel Prize winner was David Baltimore. And they talked about how David Baltimore and others were having this revolution in science called recombinant DNA. And that resulted from his cloning of reverse transcriptase and the ability to make cDNA. And at that time I said, I, I, I love Tom Seaver and Joe Namath and Walt Clyde Frazier, but in fact this is something that I could think about spending my life since my jump shot wasn't very good. So I decided to really think about maybe devoting myself to science and become a molecular biologist and actually I went to MIT because I wanted to be part of that and work with David Baltimore. So that teacher also did something that uh, was really great. He gave me a book because he, he, he saw that I was interested in science. And the book was written by a fellow who grew up just about a mile down the road from my high school in Flushing, Queens, and his name was Lewis Thomas. 
So again, although my generation probably knows who Lewis Thomas is, what I've learned is the next generation does not. So Lewis Thomas uh, was a physician scientist who at the time in 1975 uh, was the president of Memorial Sloan Kettering. And he had written a series of, of essays in the New England Journal entitled Night Notes of a Biology Watcher. And my understanding is the deal he had with, with New England Journal was he wouldn't get paid for these, but they would not, never edit what he wrote. And he had a thousand words to write it. And so he did a series of essays, and then he put them together in this book called Lives of a Cell and that won the National Book Award in 1975. And I still, after, well, it's 40 years later, remember one essay, essay that really still frames the way that I think of science, the way science can impact medicine. And the essay fundamentally talked about three stages of, develop, of our understanding of a disease and how that understanding affects treatment of the disease. The first stage he called supportive therapies, and those were the diseases that we really had no treatments for the disease at all, and what we did was really just support the patient. And a good example of that today would be Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, we really don't have a great therapy for that. And that, he argued, was the most expensive form of disease because we couldn't impact the disease at all, and supportive therapy, he argued, was very expensive. He then talked about a second stage in our understanding of disease, and he called those the diseases that use halfway technology to treat. Those are things that we had some impact on, had some understanding of the mechanism of disease, and could impact some parts of the disease, but really couldn't impact the disease itself. I'd argue asthma today would be something where we have pretty good therapeutics on it. We sort of understand a lot of the stages of the disease and some of the mechanism, but we're still not quite there yet. And that's because the third stage of disease is what he called diseases where we have decisive technology to treat. And he'd argue when we get to the stage of decisive technology and our understanding of disease is at that level, it becomes really inexpensive to treat. And the argument would be a disease like polio. Polio at some day, we now have decisive therapy and we don't treat, it's, it, it's actually fairly cheap for the healthcare system to treat polio. And that's framed my understanding and the way I think about disease. And I want to, in that framework, give some ideas about, since I began in medicine as an intern in 1984, and where we are today, really uh, 30 years later, and then talk about what happened those 30 years, just not to every, but to a couple of diseases where I think we could think about this paradigm, and then talk about the next 30 years. Um, so let's take one, the one that comes to mind, uh, 1984, I don't know if anyone else was an intern or house staff in 1984, and there was one disease in a place like New York and San Francisco we thought about, which was HIV. And again, HIV at that time was supportive therapy. We did not yet know it was a viral disease. We didn't know what spread it. We couldn't treat it. It was very expensive, and in fact, um, it was devastating to, to the patients and to those of us who treated those patients. Advanced to today, where HIV, I'd argue, is somewhere about halfway technology. We understand the disease, we can treat it. It's much cheaper to treat than it was when we had no therapy. Yet, we're not quite at, dis at, at, at decisive uh, therapies. We're pretty close, but you know we, we can't eradicate the virus yet. We're trying. We've thought we've done it once or twice, but we still have these pools that we can't get rid of, and we don't yet have, have a vaccine. So HIV is something that's come a long way uh, along that paradigm, not quite there yet, but if you think about the cost of HIV today versus cost of HIV 30 years ago, it's dramatically different. I'll give you another example where we've made, I think, dramatic input, and that would be peptic ulcer disease. Think of peptic ulcer disease in 1984, people who trained. We didn't know really what, we thought it was due to spicy food, alcohol, and tobacco, right? So when someone came in with a bleeding ulcer, you said, don't drink, don't smoke, and don't eat Italian food. And then we'd alternate, all we had were, were antacids, and we had antacids that either caused diarrhea or caused constipation, and we had to alternate them all day long. If, and so all we did was the amphigel and melox all day long and keep the people, and that's how we treated uh, peptic ulcer disease until, you know, uh, uh, you know, we had these two crazy Australians, Robin Warren and Barry Marshall, who broke the paradigm 
you know, took, uh, understood it was an infectious agent, infected themselves to prove it was infectious. And today, I would argue, we have decisive technology for peptic ulcer disease, right? You can treat it with antibiotics, and although they may not respond the first time completely over the time, we really have decisive therapy for peptic ulcer disease. Again, uh, for those of you, you know, we are no longer doing pylories and, and, and vagotomies. Remember those, you know, we used to do for those patients? I mean, we did a lot. It was very expensive. And now with antibiotics, we, we can treat peptic ulcer disease. This is not an inclusive list, and I know I'm going to forget someone's favorite disease, but let's just take heart disease. I mean, think again. Heart disease, 1984, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. Okay, you came in, and you, got, you put, were put on lidocaine. You were given morphine. You, 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 and uh, we yet didn't yet have any interventions, right? We wait the next day and they'd get bacon and eggs for breakfast, you know, in the CCU, and then if they didn't have any arrhythmia, they'd go out. And that, that's how we treated, you know, coronary disease in 1984. And in fact, in 1984, if you look at it, out of the top five hospitals, causes of hospitalization in America, three were related to coronary disease. Today, we've decreased mortality from coronary disease by 41 percent, 41 percent. Now only one of the top five hospitalization causes is related to coronary disease. And it's again due to both very basic work, and I, I saw, and we have some of the people who did that work, you know, that we've talked about in the audience today, you know, uh, Brown and Goldstein, and, you know, really important epidemiologic work from the Framingham studies and a whole bunch of things and understand cardiac cath and intervention, so a series of things. But again, coronary disease is still halfway technology, right? We, we, you know, we still don't have decisive technology for coronary disease. We've come a long way, but not quite there. So those are just, th I, I think, three examples where if you look 30 years ago and you look today, um, it'd be very different. And I was talking to someone uh, outside, and I said, you know, can we predict the next 30 years? And you could argue, well, um, I don't think anyone 30 years ago would have predicted that peptic ulcer disease was caused by bacteria, and, and we would have to decide of technology, but we did. So I don't think we can predict where we'll be in 30 years, but we know that we'll have some of these things that really we have very different paradigms to treat. So, so why do we care about that? And, you know, as I said, I, I, I give talks these days. I know I, know I close my lab, but I, I give a lot of talks about thinking about healthcare systems. I think about the American healthcare system quite a bit, and I think not only from my role as a dean, but I am the CEO of, of a large organization, and I think about where healthcare is going. And um, I go to Congress a lot, and they talk about 17 to 80 percent of our GDP being on healthcare, and they talk about where we're going with 10,000 people a year joining Medicare. And it's clearly going to be a time of tremendous change in healthcare. And that change is really around getting costs out. You know, the, the number they quote, which I don't know where they get it, is a trillion dollars of inefficiency in our healthcare system that, that needs to go away. And, and you know what they're right? Because we know that our healthcare system is what we paid for and what we incentivized. We incentivized a fee for service where, there were ver where there's very little control over volumes. Uh, and we get what we paid for, which is a very inefficient healthcare system, which really hasn't focused on costs. Well, that's going to change um, over the next five or ten years. We're going to see tremendous pressure to bring costs out. And the truth is, if you talk to people in other industries that have had this issue, it'll, we'll, we'll be able to do it. We'll be able to get this inefficiency out of our system. It won't be easy, but we'll do it. It's basic blocking and tackling. Of, of utilizing systems that have been used in other industries to get inefficiency out and co get costs out. And we'll do it. But I'd argue that, that, that that's not the long-term solution. The long-term solution is moving our science along so that we get decisive technologies to cure human disease. So let's talk about where we might be in the next 30 years along that paradigm. And, and you know, it's, and I thought, and I, I wrote these down so I didn't know quite now how to do it, because again, I sit in an office someplace. And so what I did was I, I had 12 of my department chairs, and I wrote them. I said, tell me, think about uh, not just your discipline, but tell me uh, diseases, five diseases will cure in the next five years, 10 years, or 20 years. And I put them all together and came out with consensus about some diseases where, where these you know, people think we may have, have real changes. And the number one on the list is cancer. And I think anyone who sat through the sessions yesterday and today can deny that, that cancer is something which I believe in the next five or 10 years we will dramatically 
make inroads. And, you know, you talk about, we heard uh, Levi Gary give a great talk about that yesterday, and we had several people, you know, Victor Velescu, really people who are pushing the paradigm, Craig Thompson's talk this afternoon. I mean, and, and I think there's going to be two reasons, and the reason that that's so accessible to us is, is really because of technology and because of DNA sequencing. And we, we saw Moore's curve yesterday, and we all know that the ability to sequence thousands and thousands of tumors have really allowed us to identify some of the genetic mutations that are going to mark these things. And that's going to be important for two reasons, one of which, which we learned from, from Craig a little bit today, which is directed therapies, right? So we're going to know the tumors, we're going to know what pathways are mutant, and, uh, you know, this began with Gleevec and Charles Sawyer and Brian Drucker, but it's going to move on to many, many other, th uh, you know, different directed treatments for, for tumors. And so that'll be stage one of cancer. But Victor Velescu and certainly Bert Vogelstein at Hopkins would tell you that the real therapy is, is decisive therapy of getting the tumors early before they're detectable. We, we heard about, about blood screening from Victor, but you know, we can now detect both not only cervical cancer, but ovarian cancer and, um, and uterine cancer in pap smears. So think about what we're going to do for real screening of tumors, getting these tumors really early on before they have all those mutations that I think Levi demonstrated often can bypass that. I mean, I, I remember that melanoma case he showed. And, and so I think we're going to really move to um, directed therapies and, and really to really robust screening early on. But I think that's not going to be all. And, and the other thing that we didn't talk about this session, but we learned last year from Carl June and Drew Pardol and others are real use of, of the immune system to fight cancers. And, and some of the results that they're getting uh, from these uh, uh, inhibitors of the blockades, either anti-PD-1s, anti-CTLA-4s, anti or PD-1 ligand therapies are really remarkable. They're not in all tumors, but when they're getting responses, they are robust. And it, because it's the immune system, which could adjust if, if metastases came and perhaps um, adjust the immune system recognition, may give you long-term long cures. So, I, so the consensus is, I think, cancer, we're going to see really remarkable and perhaps decisive technologies in the next several years. We heard about a couple others. Um, yes, I mean, CF, I mean, talk about how you know, DNA sequencing and technology is going to move cystic fibrosis. Both uh, Jeff Leiden and Mike Welch's talk really, uh, for me, really made me think about how we're really going to make great inroads into CF. And then, uh, you know, Dr. Lowy's talk on, on, you know, how can you not think about decisive technology in cervical cancer with the HPV uh, vaccine. Again, decisive technology which takes something away that we're going to be able to treat fairly cheaply in the future. So those are the easy, cancer I think is, is really one that we're going to make great inroads. And then the other ones, uh, I, I think again, it's funny because when I thought about this, it really relates to a lot of this, the, the talks we had. And the next one is regenerative medicine. And, and you know, we, uh, we had some wonderful uh, discussion about that. I think Dr. Kessler talked about it a little bit and, and Rudy Yanish talked about it. Uh, where that's going to go, it's obviously something that's uh, been on the forefront for a while. Maybe things like uh, regenerative lenses, uh, regenerative um, meniscus for tears would maybe the low-hanging fruit in some of that. Uh, and perhaps things like, I mean, we can now grow a retina, a three-dimensional retina in a culture dish. Uh, maybe in the future we'll be able to do that. And perhaps whole organs, but I, I'm not sure if that's 10 years or, or 20 years, but, but, but maybe down the line. So I think regenerative medicine is, is something that we hope maybe it's not a five-year project, but a 10 or 20-year project for the, some of these things. The retina, it, you know, they're already in, in phase two trials on it, so I think it, it's, it's right there. And then we talked about gene therapy, and that's obviously something if anyone, you know, this week was something we all thought about when uh, there was some, um, a, a study from China where they tried CRISPR on a, a thalassemic fetus. But I, I think, you know, uh, CRISPR may be something that, uh, that we need to study because I'm not sure we want to try uh, a fetus embryos yet, but, but think about the possibility of correcting thalassemia or sickle cell or, or hemophilia in a hematopoietic stem cell. And, you know, again, we're not there yet. The technology is still nascent, but the high level of frequency, I think, gives us great promise and thought that perhaps we'll have some decisive technologies in some of those diseases. Even now, we know that we, our ability to do fairly efficient haplotransplantation is allowing us to cure sickle cell disease. 
right? Because we're able, I know we're, we're doing it and others are, are doing haplotransplants uh, and curing sickle cell disease. So imagine that. I mean, anyone who trained in the past 30 years knows how devastating that disease is. And we're on the way to maybe having dis decisive technology in sickle cell disease. So those are, I think, things that are really worth thinking about in the next five or 10 years. And then this, this morning session with, with uh, Dan Geshwind and, and Jeremy Nathans and, 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 and then uh, Jeff Friedman's talk, really, for me, it's, it's a huge issue of, of uh, the whole spectrum of neurologic disease and psychiatric disease, from autism to Alzheimer's to, to, uh, to bipolar disease. And, and again, one could argue we, we need a lot more basic science here, but some of the technologies that I think all of us saw in the last day or two I thought were phenomenal and give me hope that it's probably not five or ten years for some of these. Uh, obviously, Alzheimer's is something that are in important clinical trials now. But again, those I think are the next big generation of, dis of diseases that we're going to tackle. I'm sure there's a lot of others I'm, b I'm forgetting out, but, but it's interesting if you think of where, where the NIH is and the president are thinking of putting resources, it's really to the brain and to precision medicine. So almost all the things I've talked about today could be put under precision medicine, be that CF or cancer or any of the neurologic diseases uh, that we talked about. In addition, you know, I think the brain just needs a lot more money put into it because I think we're at the time with, I mean, some of the technologies we, we've heard about in the last uh, day or two really give me hope that we're really going to uh, really make great breakthroughs in understanding basic brain biology and therefore diseases. So I think those are the things that I think about. But I really wanted to focus really the last 10 minutes on what's going to keep us from succeeding there. And that's what keeps me awake. People ask me, you know, what keeps me awake, and I'll, I'll be honest, it's, it's uh, issues that we're going to have to, 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 for the promise of medicine that I just talked about. And they come down to, for I argue, the big issue and then, and then a, a corollary of that. And the big issue is funding, right? So, you know, we've sat there for now a, a decade with, with flat NIH funding, and we've lost, you know, 25% of our, our purchase power with NIH dollars. And What's more concerning to me, I, I'm concerned with that, but you know, I'm concerned that we're losing the American public. So P the Pew Foundation did a, a, a study where, um, in, in, in August of 2014 across the country, and they asked people what they thought of uh, the investment of the federal government in, 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 in research. And here's a number to, to tell you. 24, 24%, 24% of the U.S. adults believe the government investment in basic science is not worth it. Despite what I just told you about these diseases that really come from very basic, basic findings, you know, and you go on the hill, and many of you advocate too, and you go on the hill and, you know, some congressman will pull out, what are you guys studying this or that for? And I, I say, well, who would have ever studied bacteria in geysers in Yellowstone and found TAC polymerase, right? Who would ever study, you know, the, what makes a jellyfish fluoresce? and win a Nobel Prize and think about molecule, you know, proteins that we now can use to explore the brain. So, you know, but the, the on the Hill and the American public, I think we have not done the job to really convince them that we need more funding. So my number one issue and, and what I'd ask people here to do is, you know, when you go to the Hill, money's very tight in Washington right now. And there are a lot of constituencies that are asking our government to spend money on them, the, you know, and, it, and it's not just the military, it's education, it's border patrol. Uh, there's a lot of people who are really asking for Congress to utilize their scarce resources for them. And we're one of those people, and that's how Congress thinks about it. We think about how can't they, how, look at what we're doing. But for them, they have a lot of constituents that they answer to. And if we're not there actively, talking in, on the Hill to our congressmen and senators and having our patients and others talk, do that same talk, we're going to lose out, and we have been losing out. There were opportunities last year to do things at NIH, and they didn't do it, a and I think we have to continue to advocate for those dollars, and all of us, and I know it's none of our sweet spots, and we all have a lot else to do, and we all have grants to write and papers to write, but if we're not there, if we don't get our patients to call up their congressmen when these votes come to NIH, I think we're going to lose out in, in the opportunity to increase funding at NIH. There's one other constituency who has a lot of resources, and it is the CEOs and hospital presidents of our academic medical centers. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put on my CEO hat. And, and so I'll just tell you what the numbers look like. 
And so, you know, uh, Johns Hopkins Medicine, our, 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 our budget this year is $7 billion. At that $7 billion, $700 million, 10% comes from external funding for our research. So you all think $700 million is a lot of money. I'm a CEO. I said, that's 10% of my budget. Do you know what percentage of my margin went to support a medical research last year? 50% of my budget. Okay, 50% of my margin of the money I get to play with cross-subsidizes research. That's a huge investment for uh, an institution to make. And we've made it, and I'm sure many others here in, in academic centers are making that investment. But now, I'm in a time of tremendous change in healthcare, right? I have to build population, health population management to ensure that my health system will survive when risk is gonna move from our insurance companies to our delivery system, and that's what's happening. Risk is moving from the insurance companies to doctors and your delivery systems. And for those who don't invest in uh, the tools to manage that, I think are gonna lose out. That's a huge investment for us. EMR, for us, epic conversion, it's gonna cost us a billion dollars over 10 years. That's a huge investment. When we're, getting, when we're getting our payments for Medicare and Medicaid based on our patient satisfaction scores, and you have any beds, if you have any rooms with two beds in it, and you think you're gonna get good patient satisfaction scores when you have two patients in a bed, you're not, and so you're gonna build new beds. So there's tremendous pressure from a healthcare executive on where that expenditure is gonna be. And if people don't advocate for research in our academic health centers with those people who control those resources, we're gonna lose out too. So although, please no one from Hopkins, flood my email, but everyone else, go to your hospital CEO or your dean and just remind them that this investment is so important at this time in this country with flat NIH funding. And long term, we need to make that investment for our country. The second thing that scares me, not only are the resources, and I said it's a correlate of the decreased resources, which is our young investigators and losing a generation of young investigators. And you know, the numbers are, are there, and I think I've written about it and others have written about it. I'll just, I'll give you some numbers if, if you doubt that. First of all, I, wanted, I have a great quote. So when William Osler, we, we heard the other day, went from Johns Hopkins to Oxford, he said the most controversial thing that he ever said, and almost, and, and was, was taught and feathered. So he said the following, the effective, moving, vitalizing work of the world is done between the ages of 25 and 40. David Baltimore was 32 when he won the Nobel Prize, 32. The, uh, an economist, Bruce Weinberg at Ohio State, estimated the ability of a Nobel laureate to occur by the age of, of, of 30 right now is zero. Zero. The average uh, first R01 has gone from age 38 in the 1980 to age 45. The MD PhD program, the average has gone from 6.6 .6 years in 1980s to eight years right now. There's a lot of causes for this. I'm not, given the time, we're not going to abate those causes. They're multiple. Some of that is through our grant funding mechanisms, but a lot of it is, is us at our academic medical centers. I think we need to really refocus some of our training paradigms. We have to talk to our crediting bodies to try to get our, our people through the um, research paradigm quicker. We need to make sure that we limit their clinical responsibilities so they're able to do the research they want to do and be able to forward their career rapidly. I think NIH needs to think about mechanisms to ensure that um, younger physician scientists get the funding they want earlier in their careers. We need to mentor them. We need to teach them about how to write a grant and how to go through the system more effectively. So I wanted to read you another quote. So this is from the William Welsh 1901 AAP speech. And this is what Welsh wrote. wrote. And he was talking about people who choose a scientific career. And he said, if he succeeds in winning his spurs, he can look forward with reasonable assurance to securing a desirable position as a teacher and a director of a laboratory of his special branch of science. I don't know if any of us feel today that that would be true in our academic medical centers, but it should be. We need to ensure that those people who want to dedicate themselves to science 
get the support that they'll need early in their career. So in conclusion, I'm going to give you one more Lewis Thomas quote. So Lewis Thomas wrote in Lives of a Cell, everyone forgets how long and hard the work must be before the really important applications become applicable. Generations of energetic and imaginative investigators exhausted their whole lives on the problems. You need the intelligible basic facts to begin with, and these must come from basic research. So it's a career that we in this audience, I'm sort of, I think, preaching to the converted a little bit. We believe in that. We believe that understanding the basic mechanisms of the disease will lead from that transition from supportive therapy to halfway technology to definitive technology. And despite all the headaches and everything we do, I think most people in this room will agree that there's nothing we'd rather do than dedicate our lives to medical science. Thank you for listening. <laughs>